This is Justice, History, and the Law. Lectures, discussions, and interviews from the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. We're blessed to have Ambassador Stephen Rapp, and in order to introduce him appropriately, I'd like to introduce David Sullivan of the Enough Project to introduce Ambassador Rapp. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm David Sullivan, uh, Policy Manager at the Enough Project, uh, and on behalf of Enough, uh, it's an enormous honor to co-sponsor the International Humanitarian Law Dialogues, and a personal privilege uh, to have the opportunity to imp- introduce uh, Ambassador Rapp, uh, continuing today's tradition of introductions for distinguished speakers that, in fact, need no introduction at all. Uh, let me briefly take a moment to introduce my own organization, uh, the Enough Project uh, at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C., uh, is helping to build a permanent constituency to prevent uh, genocide and crimes against humanity. Our work focuses on grave challenges in a number of African countries. Uh, Sudan, uh, Eastern Congo, and and areas ravaged by the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, So we have very many shared interests with the International Criminal Court. Um, Genocide and war crimes uh, are not inevitable, and our mission at Enough is to create noise and action, both to stop ongoing atrocities uh, and to prevent their recurrence. Our strategy is to energize diverse communities here in the United States, uh, including students, religious groups, activists, business leaders, celebrities, and diaspora networks to ensure that their voices are heard on some of these most pressing foreign policy challenges and moral issues facing the world today. Uh, In effect, we're trying to build a citizen movement uh, to create the enforcement uh, that is necessary um, to uh, protect civilians and hold uh, uh, war criminals to account. Um, We conduct intensive field research in countries plagued by genocide and crimes against humanity, uh, develop practical policies to address these crises, and share sensible tools to help empower citizens and groups working for change. Uh, In framing our policy prescriptions, we utilize a uh, alliterative uh, 3P approach, promoting peace, uh, protecting civilians, uh, and of particular interest to this group, uh, punishing perpetrators. Uh, now, uh, Ambassador Rapp uh, needs no introduction, uh, first and foremost, because he's a longtime veteran of these uh, dialogues. Um, but uh, since September of 2009, he served as ambassador at large for war crimes uh, at the U.S. State Department, where he advises the Secretary of State directly and formulates uh, U.S. policy responses to atrocities committed uh, in areas of conflict and elsewhere in the world. Uh, Prior to his appointment, he served as prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone beginning in January 2007, uh, leading the prosecutions of former Liberian President Charles Taylor and other persons alleged uh, to bear the greatest responsibility for the atrocities uh, committed during the Civil War in Sierra Leone. Uh, As a champion of international justice, uh, Ambassador Rep's career has been marked by not one, but many historic accomplishments um, holding perpetrators of horrific crimes to account. Uh, At the special court, his office achieved the first convictions in history for sexual slavery and forced marriage as crimes against humanity, and for attacks on peacekeepers, and for recruitment and use of child soldiers as violations of international humanitarian law. From 2001 to 2007, Ambassador Rapp served as senior trial attorney and chief of prosecutions at the International Criminal Tribunal in Rwanda, um, personally heading Uh, the team that achieved the first convictions in history for leaders uh, of the mass media for the crime of direct and public incitement to commit genocide. Uh, And from 1993 to 2001, he was a U.S. attorney in Northern District of Iowa, um, which is not somewhere we usually associate with uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity, but where his office nonetheless won historic convictions uh, under the firearms provisions of the Violence Against Women Act um, and the Serious Violent Offender Provision of the 1994 Crime Act. Uh, Ambassador Rapp has also worked as an attorney in private practice, uh, served as staff director of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, uh, and is an elected member of the Iowa legislature. And um, without further ado, it's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Ambassador Rapp. Find a place for the water here. Thank you very much, David, for that, uh, that great introduction. 
Uh, it's, it's really good to be here among so many colleagues and, and friends. And, and among them, I count uh, first and foremost my friend uh, Ben Ferens uh, back there at the second table. Uh, he said uh, that we uh, formed a team going up to West Point. Uh, uh, we also uh, went to African churches uh, together, and I hope we have uh, uh, many encore performances uh, discussing the crime of aggression. Uh, he's a great advocate, becoming only better with age, uh, uh, but we all uh, are put in mind of, of his first great advocacy and, and, uh, and, and step on the world stage, uh, uh, looking over that podium in the Eisentz Group in case uh, at the age of 27, I think 63 years ago, uh, looking across at, at 22 men who had led their forces in the murder of a million innocents and calling their crime for the first time in human history in a court of law by its true name, genocide. It's great to be back here at Chautauqua and to be learning with you. And in that context, uh, I'll say every time I've been here, and I've been for three of the four last time, I missed it because I was in my last innings in Sierra Leone and in the argument on the on the RUF appeal, which uh, the, the case that features in that, that movie, War Done Done, so I missed uh, one of the four sessions. Uh, but it's always a learning experience, and uh, that was again the case this afternoon when we heard uh, 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 Bill Kamings uh, uh, talk about his experience in the ministry's case, a case that, that few of us uh, uh, knew very much about. Uh, we're familiar with the subsequent proceedings, and, and, and certainly uh, uh, Ben's and the one that was featured in Judgment at Nuremberg. Uh, but, the, uh, but I was fascinated by his discussion about how in that case, dealing with the crime of aggression, they had been successful in holding the certain Nazi leaders responsible uh, for the aggression against Austria and against Bohemia and Moravia, the unoccupied parts of Czechoslovakia, when there had been no resistance. And they'd won the convictions uh, nonetheless, given the overwhelming force, given the threat, uh, uh, given the pressure, the intimidation, and everything in the whole context uh, that the Nazi attack involved. And it actually put me in mind of a struggle that we in the international tribunals have had on another issue, on, on the rape issue, uh, where we had to struggle with the question of whether in the context of thousands of women being raped in the course of a campaign against civilians, it was necessary to prove that the woman didn't consent uh, or that she had resisted. And uh, we actually won that issue in the first trial at the ICTR in Akeesu. It was later lost at the ICTY, and uh, the issue has gone back and forth uh, with not, with I think a, uh, a somewhat successful resolution, uh, but not the successful, as successful a, re a resolution as, as Bill achieved. We probably uh, should have been citing uh, uh, the ministry's case. Uh, it's also great to be back, in particular, uh, with colleagues who are uh, still at the coalface uh, that are doing the, the difficult and, uh, and, and, and accomplishing uh, a mission where, where none thought it possible, uh, day after day and week after week in these international courts, uh, to be with the chief prosecutors and their deputies and, and others uh, that are here uh, from those courts. Uh, Bill Pace's comment this afternoon, I think, couldn't have been more appropriate. We need to hear it again and again. Uh, international justice, as it's developed in, the, in this post-Cold War era, is the greatest success of the international system. Uh, it's not been easy. The resources are not there. We've heard and about how courts have to go hand in hand to capitals uh, to survive at, at peril of, of setting all the accused free. And as we've heard time and time again, including from Ben, the powers aren't there. The enforcement that when I was a U.S. attorney in Iowa, when we got an arrest warrant from, from the judges, when we got an indictment from the grand jury, uh, we could get the person arrested. We could be sure that, uh, uh, that they would face trial. And that challenge is, uh, remains an immense one in these international institutions. But despite that, uh, these courts have successfully brought chiefs of state to trial, a Milosevic and a Charles Taylor. They've convicted a head of government, John Kambanda, of, of genocide. 
They brought in countless military commanders and, and, and militia leaders and others responsible for the gravest crimes that could be committed against humankind. It's a work in progress, an imperfect one, but one that requires, I think, our constant dedication and commitment. I'm not now a prosecutor. I have been now uh, for uh, a year or less a week uh, a diplomat. And uh, that is a changed uh, position, but nonetheless a position that I see as, as one uh, where I try to, uh, to meet this challenge of trying to find those resources, of trying to provide the power uh, that will make possible the success of these tribunals and, and justice for the victims. It is, however, quite different to be a diplomat uh, working for a single government, albeit a mighty one, uh, of a mighty country, uh, and being a prosecutor. When I was a prosecutor, and I proudly cited this whenever ambassadors would say we were stepping out of line on one thing or another, I would say, well, I took an oath, Your Excellency, uh, never to take instructions from any government or, or any organization. And, and that's an extremely important part of, of, of this role. On the other hand, those of us involved in the process needed those governments, uh, needed the, their forces uh, to, to succeed in a world of states, uh, where it was only states that could provide us with the muscle to accomplish our task. But it was nonetheless the decision of prosecutors, the decisions of the judges for whom they went to, uh, for decisions that mattered, not the decisions of those uh, from elected governments of, of, of any state. But uh, now, uh, I'm a diplomat, and rather than not taking instructions, my job is to take instructions uh, every day. Uh, but the good thing about the job is that one can be involved in, in writing uh, those instructions. and. Uh, and since coming into this, into this post, uh, and particularly in the context of the ICC issues that we're here to talk about, and the crime of aggression, but also our engagement with the ICC, uh, we've been we have been engaged within our government in, in developing our policy, in developing our approach, in deciding uh, what the instructions would be uh, to ourselves uh, as we went uh, to the Assembly of States Parties for the first time in eight years in November of 2009 and continued in March of 2010 and then, and then participated as an observer at the review conference in, in, in 2010. And uh, even while that was a, a process where no one uh, got his or her own way, uh, it was one uh, where our views uh, were respected and where the results in terms of our government policy were those that I can vigorously support and push as the representative of the government of the United States. As we said um, when we came out, so to speak, at the uh, review conference in November of, of 2009, the first time uh, that the United States had participated in an ICC institution in, in eight years, uh, we recognized that we'd been absent. Uh, that it wasn't our position to lecture those that had been involved in, in these debates, but to listen and to learn. But to also emphasize that while we had been absent from the ICC, uh, we had not been silent in the, faces, in the face of, of crimes that, that shocked the universal conscience. And in our support and in our active, uh, not just dues paying, participation uh, in these institutions at uh, Sierra Leone and in the uh, former Yugoslavia and in Rwanda and in the other courts. Uh, we had also participated in, in, in pointing the way and providing leads information and powerful assistance and conditionality when it came uh, to bringing the responsibles uh, to justice, the responsibles for, for genocide and war crimes and crimes against humanity. And in, in giving that speech, of course, we were also emphasizing that these are the crimes uh, that we are focusing on. And, and because? Because in part, uh, this, these are sadly 
the crimes that are being committed in the world of the 21st century. We are not in an age of cross-border conflict to a large extent. We're not in the age of Louis XVI or, or, or Napoleon I or, or uh, Bismarck or, or, or even World War I or 1939 when great armies uh, uh, crossed the borders where tens of thousands or even millions have faced each other across uh, uh, trenches. Uh, we're in an age where in conflict it is so much more dangerous to be a civilian woman or child than it is to be a soldier. In the Eastern DRC, you hardly ever hear of a militia person being killed or raped, but you hear of thousands, tens of thousands of people being murdered and raped that are totally innocent, uninvolved in the conflict. I once asked a, uh, a commander of the National Gendarmerie that was nationalized during the, uh, during the Rwanda conflict uh, on the side of the genocidal government, how many soldiers of the Rwandan armed forces were killed defending Rwanda against the RPF, uh, he said probably fewer than 100. How many RPF soldiers were killed? Probably fewer. Now that's a little hard to believe. But 800,000 men, women, and children were killed. Those are the victims of the conflict that we have today. The victims we saw just, I was just in Goma in, in DRC, uh, two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago, hearing reports of the, of the rapes uh, committed uh, not, uh, not uh, 30 miles uh, from, from where I was, of, of more than 200 uh, women and girls raped by the forces of, of, of the FDLR. Uh, those are the crimes that the world needs to respond to, to say enough and to bring the responsible to justice. Those are associated with non-international armed conflict. But many of the atrocities are not even associated with conflict. We look to Guinea, where more than 100 are murdered and shot to death in a, in a stadium on the afternoon of September 21st, 2009, and then women are raped on the stands and taken off to rape houses. No conflict, no civil war there, but a systematic attack upon a political basis against a civilian uh, population. Uh, I'm spending probably a third or 40 percent of my energy now on Kyrgyzstan, uh, where in Ju June there was an eruption of ethnic violence, a harbinger of ethnic violence that could explode again in Kyrgyzstan and across Central Asia between the Kyrgyz and the Uzbeks, with hundreds dead, murdered by their neighbors, trying to get uh, accountability in that situation, in an area where democracy has, has barely taken hold. But uh, we are moving in the direction, I hope, of accountability, but not in a place of conflict, not in a civil war, but yet uh, a widespread or systematic attack against civilians. International justice in this situation is profoundly challenged. The ad hoc tribunals, with the support that they've had uh, uh, from the United Nations, with their ability to use things like conditionality in the case of, uh, of the uh, Yugoslavia Tribunal to, to push for arrests in, in the countries of the former Yugoslavia, both uh, in terms of, of aid but also uh, EU accession, have, have had successes. But now, and the reason for our engagement in the ICC, is a recognition that if there's going to be an answer at the international level for the atrocities being committed tonight, uh, it's not going to happen at the Rwanda Tribunal with a 1994 jurisdiction or at the ICTY or any of these other institutions with their narrow and ad hoc uh, mandates. It'll either have to happen at the national level, where of course it's always best, at the national level with, with international assistance and participation, which might be possible. But if those alternatives are not possible, it will have to happen in the International Criminal Court. That's where these trials will be brought. 
That's where the butchers will need to face justice. And that's where Americans need to be supported to ensure its success. And so the message we delivered uh, in, in The Hague and in New York and in Kampala was that we want to work with this court to succeed, that we're worried when we see four arrest, 13 arrest warrants and only four arrested. We're crushed with, with anger and disappointment when we see the accused or indicted or against whom arrest warrants are, are issued uh, go to even members of the, uh, of the ICC like Chad and Kenya and come and go without any effort to effectuate the orders of this criminal court. We need to do what we can to make this institution succeed. It's difficult, as we've heard, for the United States to ratify a treaty. There are issues in terms of, of how we would uh, square that uh, with, with, with our national constitution, how we would build the support to make that possible. But at least at this stage, we want to make it possible for this institution to succeed, to be as uh, as was recommended by the uh, Council of Foreign Relations, something like a non-party partner, uh, to make uh, it possible to, uh, to, to particularly affect these arrests. And in that regard, uh, uh, we've seen the, uh, uh, the Congress of the United States uh, almost unanimously passing legislation uh, calling for U.S. efforts to, uh, to arrest and bring Joseph Kony to, to justice, uh, a message emphasized by President Obama in his signing statement. In other ways, uh, making our diplomatic and political support clear. Uh, you may have seen on Friday after Bashir was in Kenya, uh, the President himself uh, issued a statement uh, on what should have been a proud day for Kenya, the beginning of the Second Republic, the ratification of a, of a constitution that provides a separation of powers that opens hope for, for Kenyan democracy. but. Uh, a three-paragraph statement and the longest paragraph, the third, expressing disappointment about the country of his father uh, failing to honor its commitment to the ICC to arrest uh, Omar al-Bashir. And in other ways, we're seeking, uh, consistent with our laws, and we have some restrictive ones that passed Congress in 2001 and 2002 that in some ways uh, uh, restrain our ability to assist the courts, but with, uh, uh, with uh, I think, appropriate, the ICC specifically, but with appropriate override provisions uh, uh, on a case-specific basis. We're working uh, to, to, in particular, uh, provide assistance for, for victims and, and witnesses whose protection is so important if they're to be successful uh, prosecutions. It's a challenge in the United States where, as you know, uh, we've, not, uh, we've not ratified many human rights uh, conventions. I, I heard the other day some, some dismaying news uh, on the, commission, on the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. As you probably know, there are only two countries in the world uh, that have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is, uh, uh, contains principles that every American could subscribe to, uh, and those are the United States and Somalia. I heard that despite the fact that they were being attacked in their hotels and, and other places and the Somali National Assembly is in a very challenged situation, they now have it on their agenda to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child. When I mentioned that to my friend Navi Pile, the High Commissioner on Human Rights in, in, in Geneva, she said, and she was not, she's not always someone who likes to be nice on, uh, but she said, you know, that is unfortunate, but you in America uh, protect the rights of the child so much better than many of the countries that have ratified uh, that, that treaty and, and so many others. And of course, that represents an American attitude uh, that we can do it right ourselves, that we have institutions, we have our Bill of Rights, we have our own protections, and, that, and we can make it work on ourselves. And overcoming that attitude in the United States and, and joining in international organizations. Remember the challenge of even joining the League of Nations, which Wilson sold the world on and then couldn't sell in America, uh, is always a difficult one. But we do know that when it comes to individual cases, 
as, as David discovered when he was seeking support on the arrest of Charles Taylor. And David and his successor and my predecessor Desmond, they went to, uh, uh, to the Congress and got a resolution, I think 434 to 1, to arrest Charles Taylor. Only Ron Paul uh, voting no. <laughs> and uh, because he doesn't believe we should have a foreign policy. <laughs> there may be a few more like that, I hope not. But in any case, there's a massive uh, uh, number of Americans on both the right and left that want justice in these cases. And if we work this on the case-specific basis of justice in Darfur, of Coney, of, of the, of, uh, of, of the post-election uh, violence, the people that, uh, that burned up uh, 1,200 of their fellow citizens uh, over an election result and, and made it an ethnic conflict, if we uh, talk about those crimes and those responsible, there's the ability uh, to build, uh, uh, to build uh, support. But that, uh, of course, brings me to the second question, which I guess is the topic of the conference, which is how does this all relate uh, to the crime of aggression? And I think, first of all, it needs to be emphasized so strong that this administration, that this government, that this country believes in and is proud of and supports what we did as a nation, what brave men like Justice Jackson and Ben Ferens and Bill Kaming and Whitney Harris and others did at Nuremberg, including the prosecution for counts one and two for conspiracy to wage an aggressive war and for uh, committing the acts involved in an aggressive war. And were this a battle over the Nuremberg principles and putting the law of Nuremberg uh, into the international statute book, it would be different. Uh, ben says this has been defined. It was indeed defined at Nuremberg as, as an aggressive war uh, that we prosecuted there. Uh, but what came through the process a process that we really shouldn't criticize too vigorously because the past administration should have been re sending representatives uh, to the working group to deal with writing the law of aggression. And they didn't, even though the Chinese and the Russians, non-parties and one on non-signer, uh, did. Uh, in that process, the definition that was developed was one that departed significantly from Nuremberg. We were... Um, there was indeed, even coming out of this consensus before I joined the administration as, as they finished the last of the working groups, this definition that talked about a manifest act, a, an act of such character, gravity, and scale as it would constitute a manifest violation of the, uh, of the UN Charter. Now, as a prosecutor, I find it hard to draw elements out of that and to figure out how I'm going to make a case in the same way that other things. It looks like a political compromise. And as we began to talk to people about it, we discovered that different people saw different things uh, in that. Of course, uh, we made the argument uh, that this could well bring the ICC uh, into border conflicts and issues, what's a manifest violation? Is that serious? Is that egregious? No. It means your forces were on this side of the border, the border's there, and then they cross over. It's manifest. Now, is that realistic? I remember talking to uh, representatives of Caribbean and, and Latin countries, uh, Western Hemisphere uh, countries, about uh, the uh, Colombian intervention in Ecuador uh, two years ago in March. Uh, when Colombian forces uh, crossed over into Ecuador and attacked a camp of the FARC, which is a Colombian-based group that was involved, obviously, in kidnapping and other, and, and, and other horrendous acts, including, uh, uh, including victimizing civilians, but is doing it on a political basis. They went over and attacked that, seized some computers, uh, killed some individuals, and, and returned to the Colombian side of the border. The Ecuadorians accused... Uh, uh, Colombia of, of, of aggression. They've even charged a Colombian uh, officer in Ecuadorian courts for aggression. I said, well, is this aggression? I've asked, asked these various people. And some of them said, oh, absolutely not. 
That's not aggression. That's not a manifest violation. Others said, yes, that is. That's what this court should be involved in. Those cases sent to the, to the prosecutor. What's the prosecutor to do? Well, I tell you what I do. I look at that and I say, doesn't look that serious, doesn't look that grave. I say, no, we're not going forward on that. At that point, countries say, that prosecutor, he's in the pocket of the Yankees, he's against Chavez and his group, et cetera. You, you get the prosecutor involved in these various sort of cross-border issues, and the court, which already has difficulty getting cooperation, even on mass atrocity, suddenly finds itself cast on one side or another of these kind of conflicts. Uh, Richard Goldstone put it well in, the, uh, in, a, in a very persuasive op-ed that, that came out in the days before Kampala. He described uh, taking on the responsibility among his Rwandan responsibilities as, as chief prosecutor for the former Yugoslavia and at dealing then with, with the atrocities being committed against civilians and pleased that he didn't have on the plate aggression. You only have to go to the Balkans today to talk to Croatians who say they were invaded as in a war of aggression by the Serbs and hear the Serbs saying they were just fighting a war against the secessionist force. They were like Abe Lincoln. These people have very different views of this political issue. He was happy he didn't have to settle that one. He could focus on the crimes that shocked the universal conscience, going in and attacking and murdering uh, uh, innocent uh, civilians uh, to try to displace them and force them uh, uh, into other places, uh, so-called ethnic cleansing and other mass atrocities. That's the, the danger of something that's not written very precisely. But I think it's also important to note, as, as Michael Scharf said uh, today, uh, that from an American point of view, we were also concerned about what the impact would be on intervention, uh, when there was an indeed a justified cause uh, for the use of force, but where for political reasons uh, uh, it wasn't possible to obtain a, a Security Council approval of that uh, before one went in, as, as in the case of, of, of Kosovo. And when we asked individuals, well, would this, would if you were involved in humanitarian intervention, humanitarian intervention where no civilians are killed, where every law of war is observed, and, and where you go in and go out, is that, is that aggression? They said, well, did you get approval of the Security Council before you did it? <laughs> and said, no, it's aggression. You should be prosecuted. Maybe you'll get a light sentence because of your good motives. Uh, couldn't we get that cleared up? Couldn't we maybe write that down and, and, and make it clear? Well, somebody tried to do that during the debates when you weren't there, but people didn't want to do that because they were afraid that that might give a green light to those kinds of things. So we discovered in terms of the role that we play in the world that there could be repercussions uh, when for the best motives and to prevent genocide, to prevent war crimes, to prevent crimes against humanity, we acted to protect people. It does lead one to a bit of a reflection uh, about, uh, about the use of force uh, in the world. And uh, I usually don't give this speech uh, to many crowds, but I think I can give it to this one. We do have to recognize all of us who've been involved in this process. And some were involved in both parts of it, as Ben was in Europe. The debt we owe to people who went in harm's way and who exercised force in a way that facilitated the, uh, the bringing to justice of those responsible. The Nazi leaders, Goering or Rippentrop or Hess or Speer, would never have been in the dock if the world had not committed more treasure than it had ever spent and more lives that had ever lost, including millions of soldiers on the Allied side, to defeat the Nazis, to destroy their government, to erase their scourge, and to bring those responsible to justice. They and their descendants would still be in power were it not for that effort. And when we deal with Cambodia, 
I was in Cambodia, as, as Andrew knows, for the announcement of the first judgment uh, a month ago on July 26th afterwards. Met with a couple of the survivors of S21. Uh, they were uh, among a few of a dozen people that survived a camp that tortured and sent to their deaths more than 12,000. They lived because the Vietnamese invading army arrived and freed them. If it hadn't, they'd have died. They'd have been tortured. They'd have confessed. They'd have been, they'd have been taken to the killing fields and those, those iron bars used to crush their skulls. And thousands of others would have, would have followed. Uh, you remember, of course, that, that that invasion by Vietnam was disfavored in the world, including by our government. And as a result, for 10 years at least, the genocidal government, if you can call it that, of Pol Pot, remained in the UN seats uh, because it had been illegitimately displaced by a force that stopped one of the worst crimes of the 20th century. And when you go to Rwanda, and I was there a week and a half ago, and uh, took a boat, hired a boat for my wife and daughter and myself to go from Goma and Gisenyi in the north to Changugu and Bukavu in the south, the full length of the Great Lake Kivu. A beautiful trip. This is what passes as a vacation when you've got this, this, this kind of work. But as I was crossing Lake Kivu, I remembered one of the broadcasts that I featured in my, in my presentation in the media trial of, of RTLM. Uh, it was one of what I called RTLM's greatest hits, the 30 broadcasts that I thought were the most devastating and showing uh, their incitement uh, to the genocide. And, uh, but it was the only one, and one of the few cases, where any of these guys that are responsible recognize the possibility of international justice. And it's a broadcast around the 25th of July by Quintano Habimana. And he's just received, and they're reading their wire service reports, and they've just received word that in New York, there's the first mention that there may be an international tribunal for Rwanda. Now, the government is not yet defeated. And he says uh, in the broadcast, we got to win this war. we got to win this war, because if we lose, there is no trench in Lake Kivu so deep that they won't fish us out and put us on trial. Well, they lost the war. Within a month of that day, the RPF defeated them. They were forced to cross Lake Kivu. And, uh, and some of them continued running. And with the mandate provided to the ICTR, but with the fact that it was now a defeated government, it was now individuals without a state, without a capital, without, uh, without all that goes with it, it was possible to chase them down in 26 different countries and obtain cooperation and bring them to Arusha uh, to stand trial. And also in regard to Sierra Leone, let's not forget that it was uh, forces uh, that, uh, that beat the RUF that made it possible to bring them to justice. The peace plan of 1999 uh, would not have allowed them to be brought to justice. It contained an amnesty. It was only after they refused to disarm when more international peacekeepers came in, when the British intervened, that it was finally possible to defeat them and bring them to justice. And Charles Taylor, three years later, president of Liberia, is in the presidential mansion while he's indicted. But it's only when he faces the force of the, of the rebel groups, the Lourdes and the, and the Modell, uh, that he's forced from office, admittedly, uh, a retreat rather than be shot in the presidential palace at, at great cost and, and on his way to Nigeria uh, where eventually it was possible to effect his arrest. Now in bringing up all these examples I want to make it absolutely clear that no matter what the, the goal when it comes to stopping genocide one cannot commit atrocities one cannot violate the laws of war. And it's certainly one of the prouder things that I did in Sierra Leone, uh, that I followed uh, a David Crane's courageous indictment of the CDF leadership, 
those that had fought against the RUF, against the folks that were hacking off the arms and, and committing mass campaigns of rape and, and, and gouging out other organs and enslaving people and digging diamonds, that force in the course of its campaign, certain aspects of it under certain individuals, committed atrocities and brutalities against people in areas that they thought had been sympathetic to those rebels. It's that brutality, one side thinking their brutality justifies the other, that makes all the world blind and handless. And prosecuting both sides in that case is the necessity of international justice. And finally, let it be noted that force alone isn't the answer, as I think Nuremberg taught us, and is that each of these courts taught us. That means you need to, uh, to stop the atrocities, overthrow the butchers, but not just line them against the wall and shoot them or send them off to an exile with some of their money because uh, it's uh, too difficult to do anything else. Trying them, developing the evidence, showing the public what happened, who was killed, why, when, and where is a critical part of preventing it from happening again. Certainly as we see most classically in Cambodia, where after, after this invasion of 1979, for the next 25 years, uh, people had little knowledge of what had happened and why it happened. And the court's role is so critical to providing that knowledge, that truth-seeking, that justice, without which we risk it all happening again. In regard to, to this use of force, I, I wanted to, to quote for a moment uh, from the president of my country in his Nobel speech, which I think we, we all heard. And I think it's, uh, it's important to note and important to remember, though disturbing in terms of, uh, of humankind. As he said, Make no mistake, evil does exist in the world. A nonviolent movement could not have stopped Hitler's armies. And none of us, not the most courageous prosecutor, thinks that a warrant set to the Reich Chancellor in, in 1939 would have stopped the conflict that followed. That's my addition. Negotiations cannot convince Al-Qaeda and its leaders to lay down their arms. To say that force is sometimes necessary is not a call to cynicism. It is a recognition of history, the importance and the limits of, re oh, excuse me, the imperfections. It's a, it's a recognition of history. I have to read my own writing the imperfections of man, and the limits of reason. As the President went on and said, I raise this point because there's a deep suspicion and ambivalence about military action in many parts of the world. And at times, this is joined by a reflexive suspicion of America as the world's only superpower. That's the challenge that we in Kampala had to confront. How do we deal with the role of the world's superpower? The only power that in many cases stands between the butcher and his victim, between those who would kill 3,000 people for their morning coffee, innocently going about their daily work. How do we deal with reality in the world while signaling our desire for a world of law, a world where law can eventually replace force? But we engaged in this process, and, and I'm proud of the result. And I think those of, who are interested in international justice and, and including those interested in the development of the crime of aggression, I think can be proud of the result. The, the, uh, the definition 
If you recall, uh, as I said, the term manifest was perhaps uh, imprecise. We did succeed and pushed for understandings that became part of the, the resolution of adoption that said that this applied only to the most serious and dangerous uses of force in the world. We additionally obtained a, an understanding that said that those terms character, gravity, and scale were not to be viewed as one was sufficient, that one would have to look at the entire package and make sure that the aggression that you're dealing with is something that has the character, the malicious character, the gravity, not something a, a small and simple operation, the scale that uh, would justify uh, international action. So we think that the definition was improved, even though it had already been written and was already the subject of international consensus. It also, what passed in Kampala, included uh, uh, two amendments uh, dealing with the, uh, the exercise of jurisdiction. One, uh, uh, denominated as 15 TUR, will, uh, would empower the Security Council to take up any case of aggression, make a finding, and send that case to the ICC for any country in the world, any situation in the world, whether that country had ratified the ICC or not, in the same way that it sent the Darfur situation. Some will say the Security Council will protect its own, that that's an imperfect solution. We recall a Security Council Act with, a, with 10 resolutions uh, uh, with unanimity against the Iraqi invasion in 1990 of, of Kuwait. We can imagine confronted with similar cases of aggression, it would be compelled to act similarly. That provision will take effect if 30 countries ratify and if two-thirds of the countries meeting in 2017 or two-thirds or a consensus or whatever is believed to be the necessity at that time for, a, for the approvement of an amendment, which is a minimum of two-thirds of the, of the assembly, of the total membership, if that's approved. And that could go immediately into effect. There's, of course, the more controversial part from our point of view, the provision that said in other cases where the Security Council hasn't approved it, where it's come from a state or come from the prosecutor's own investigation, uh, that it would be possible for that case uh, to go forward based upon a decision of the pretrial, uh, uh, the pretrial um, uh, division, all the pretrial judges uh, sitting together. That'll take a two-thirds, that'll take 30 ratifications and, and a two-thirds vote. That won't apply to the nationals of non-parties. That won't apply to countries that ratify the amendment uh, and then opt out. And in our view, it won't apply to those that don't ratify the amendment. That's an imperfect solution, I know, from Ben's point of view. It concerns us, of course, that that could be the kind of prosecution where a party doing the right thing could find itself discouraged, could find itself without allies when it was necessary to build a coalition for effective action. But this is a process. It's not the end of the road, it's the beginning. And just as the United States is engaging with the ICC on the atrocity crimes, and just as we are engaging now in trying to find an answer to aggression, a definition that works, at least a Security Council route, as we build confidence in the court, as we deal with the situations that evolve, there can be a, a future where the application could be perhaps more universal. But as I say, it's a work in progress, as is the field of international justice. Earlier uh, in a speech last night, uh, John Barrett mentioned how some at Nuremberg uh, thought that this was going to be a difficult challenge, that it might all come to naught. And I think that all of us that have been engaged in this process have sometimes felt that way. We've sometimes seen the absence of resources. 
the difficulty of getting personnel that, that are familiar with courtroom procedures, the, the challenges of, of political cooperation, of getting arrests, of getting assistance. We've seen these challenges, and they've been overcome. I'm confident uh, that the, with the kind of effort that those in this room have brought to international justice, that the young people that we saw this afternoon, who are in record numbers, inspired to join this field, I'm confident that these challenges can overcome, can be overcome, and that we can face a future when people will be deterred from the kind of crimes that we've seen in the courts at Nuremberg and The Hague and Arusha and Phnom Penh and where the promise of, of never again can truly be fulfilled. Thank you very much. The Jackson Center is a historical and educational facility dedicated to preserving the legacy of this country lawyer who became Solicitor General, Attorney General, a Justice of the Supreme Court, and served as Chief Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials of Nazi war criminals following World War II. To learn more about this program, Robert Jackson, the Jackson Center, and upcoming events, the Jackson Center is located at 305 East 4th Street, Jamestown, New York, and found on the web at www.roberthjackson.org or contacted by telephoning 716-483-6646.